Track 36. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track 36. The Story Continued by Walter Hartwright. 7. There was no lamp in the hall, but by the dim light of the kitchen candle which the girl had brought upstairs with her, I saw an elderly lady steal noiselessly out of a back room on the ground floor. She cast one viperish look at me as I entered the hall, but said nothing, and went slowly upstairs without returning my bow. My familiarity with Marion's journal sufficiently assured me that the elderly lady was Madame Fosco. The servant led me to the room which the Countess had just left. I entered it and found myself face to face with the Count. He was still in his evening dress except his coat, which he had thrown across a chair. His shirt-sleeves were turned up at the wrists, but no higher. A carpet-bag was on one side of him, and a box on the other. Books, papers, and articles of wearing apparel were scattered about the room. On a table at one side of the door stood a cage, so well known to me by description, which contained his white mice. The canaries and the cockatoo were probably in some other room. He was seated before the box, packing it, when I went in, and rose with some papers in his hand to receive me. His face still betrayed the plain traces of the shock that had overwhelmed him at the opera. His fat cheeks hung loose. His cold grey eyes were furtively vigilant. His voice, look, and manner were all sharply suspicious alike as he advanced a step to meet me, and requested, with distant civility, that I would take a chair. "'You come here on business, sir,' he said. "'I am at a loss to know what that business can possibly be.' The unconcealed curiosity, with which he looked hard in my face while he spoke, convinced me that I had passed unnoticed by him at the opera. He had seen Pesca first, and from that moment till he left the theatre he had evidently seen nothing else. My name would necessarily suggest to him that I had not come to his house with other than a hostile purpose towards himself. But he appeared to be utterly ignorant thus far of the real nature of my errand. "'I am fortunate in finding you here to-night,' I said. "'You seem to be on the point of taking a journey.' "'Is your business connected with my journey?' "'In some degree.' "'In what degree? Do you know where I am going to?' No. I only know why you are leaving London." He slipped by me with the quickness of thought, locked the door, and put the key in his pocket. "'You and I, Mr. Hartwright, are excellently well acquainted with one another by reputation,' he said. "'Did it by any chance occur to you, when you came to this house, that I was not the sort of man you could trifle with?' "'It did occur to me,' I replied, "'and I have not come to trifle with you. I am here on a matter of life and death.' and if that door which you have locked was open at this moment, nothing you could say or do would induce me to pass through it." I walked further into the room, and stood opposite to him on the rug before the fireplace. He drew a chair in front of the door, and sat down on it, with his left arm resting on the table. The cage with the white mice was close to him, and the little creatures scampered out of their sleeping-place as his heavy arm shook the table, and peered at him through the gaps in the smartly painted wires. On a matter of life and death, he repeated to himself. Those words are more serious, perhaps, than you think. What do you mean? What I say. The perspiration broke out thickly on his broad forehead. His left hand stole over the edge of the table. There was a drawer in it with a lock, and a key was in the lock. His finger and thumb closed over the key, but did not turn it. So, you know why I am leaving London, he went on. "'Tell me the reason, if you please.' He turned the key, and unlocked the drawer as he spoke. "'I can do better than that,' I replied. "'I can show you the reason, if you like.' "'How can you show it?' "'You have got your coat off,' I said. "'Roll up the shirt-sleeve on your left arm, and you will see it there.' The same livid, leaden change passed over his face, which I had seen pass over it at the theatre. The deadly glitter in his eyes shone steady and straight into mine. He said nothing, 
but his left hand slowly opened the table drawer and softly slipped into it the harsh grating noise of something heavy that he was moving unseen to me sounded for a moment then ceased the silence that followed was so intense that the faint ticking nibble of the white mice at their wires was distinctly audible where I stood my life hung by a thread and I knew it at that final moment I thought with his mind I felt with his fingers I was as certain as if I had seen it of what he kept hidden from me in the drawer wait a little I said you've got the door locked you see I don't move you see my hands empty wait a little I have something more to say you have said enough he replied with a sudden composure so unnatural and so ghastly that it tried my nerves as no outbreak of violence could have tried them I want one moment for my thoughts if you please do you guess what I'm thinking about perhaps I do I am thinking he remarked quietly whether I shall add to the disorder in this room by scattering your brains about the fireplace if I had moved at that moment I saw in his face that he would have done it I advise you to read two lines of writing which I have about me I rejoined before you finally decide that question the proposal appeared to excite his curiosity he nodded his head I took Pesca's acknowledgment of the receipt of my letter out of my pocket-book handed it to him at arm's length and returned to my former position in front of the fireplace he read the lines aloud your letter is received if I don't hear from you before the time you mention I will break the seal when the clock strikes another man in his position would have needed some explanation of those words the Count felt no such necessity one reading of the note showed him the precaution that I had taken as plainly as if he had been present at the time when I adopted it the expression of his face changed on the instant and his hand came out of the drawer empty I don't lock up my drawer mr. Hartwright he said and I don't say that I may not scatter your brains about the fireplace yet but I am a just man even to my enemy and I will acknowledge beforehand that they are cleverer brains than I had thought them come to the point sir you want something of me I do and I mean to have it on conditions on no conditions his hand dropped into the drawer again bah we're traveling in a circle he said and those clever brains of yours are in danger again your tone is deplorably impudent sir moderate it on the spot the risk of shooting you on the place where you stand is less to me than the risk of letting you out of this house except on conditions that I dictate and approve you have not got my lamented friend to deal with now you are face to face with Fosco if the lives of twenty mr. Hartwrights were the stepping stones to my safety over all those stones I would go sustained by my sublime indifference self balanced by my impenetrable calm respect me if you love your own life I summon you to answer three questions before you open your lips again hear them they are necessary to this interview answer them they are necessary to me he held up one finger of his right hand first question he said you come here possessed of information which may be true or may be false where did you get it I decline to tell you no matter I shall find out if that information is true mind I say with the whole force of my resolution if you are making your market of it here by treachery of your own or by treachery of some other man I note that circumstance for the future use in my memory which forgets nothing and proceed he held up another finger second question those lines you invited me to read are without signature who wrote them a man whom I have every reason to depend on and whom you have every reason to fear my answer reached him to some purpose his left hand trembled audibly in the drawer how long do you give me he asked putting his third question in a quieter tone before the clock strikes and the seal is broken time enough for you to come to my terms I replied give me a plainer answer mr. Hartwright what hour is the clock to strike nine tomorrow morning nine tomorrow morning yes yes 
Your trap is laid for me before I can get my passport regulated and leave London. It is not earlier, I suppose. We shall see about that pleasantly. I can keep you hostage here and bargain with you to send for your letter before I let you go. In the meantime, be so good as to mention your terms. You shall hear them. They're simple and soon stated. You know whose interests I represent in coming here? He smiled with the most supreme composure and carelessly waved his right hand. I consent to hazard a guess, he said jeeringly. A lady's interest, of course. My wife's interests. He looked at me with the first honest expression that had crossed his face in my presence, an expression of blank amazement. I could see that I sank in his estimation as a dangerous man from that moment. He shut up the drawer at once, folded his arms over his breast, and listened to me with a smile of satirical attention. You are well enough aware, I went on, of the course which my inquiries have taken for many months past. You know that any attempted denial of plain facts will be quite useless in my presence. You are guilty of an infamous conspiracy, and the gain of a fortune of ten thousand pounds was your motive for it. He said nothing, but his face became overclouded suddenly by a lowering anxiety. Keep your gain, I said. His face lightened again immediately, and his eyes opened on me in wider and wider astonishment. I'm not here to disgrace myself by bargaining for money, which has passed through your hands, and which has been the price of a vile crime. Gently, Mr. Hartwright, your moral claptraps have an excellent effect in England. Keep them for yourself and your own countrymen, if you please. The ten thousand pounds was a legacy left to my excellent wife by the late Mr. Fairley. Place the affair on those grounds, and I will discuss it if you like. To a man of my sentiments, however, the subject is deplorably sordid. I prefer to pass it over. I invite you to resume the discussion of your terms. What do you demand? In the first place, I demand a full confession of the conspiracy, written and signed in my presence by yourself. He raised his finger again. One, he said, checking me off with the steady attention of a practical man. In the second place, I demand a plain proof which does not depend on your personal asseveration of the date at which my wife left Blackwater Park and travelled to London. So, so, you can lay your finger, I see, on the weak place, he remarked composedly. Any more? At present, no more. Good. You have mentioned your terms. Now listen to mine. The responsibility to myself of admitting what you are pleased to call the conspiracy is less, perhaps, on the whole than the responsibility of laying you dead on that hearth-rug. Let us say that I meet your proposal, on my own conditions. The statement you demand of me shall be written, and the plain proof shall be produced. You call a letter from my late lamented friend informing me of the day and the hour of his wife's arrival in London, written, signed, and dated by himself, a proof, I suppose? I can give you this. I can also send you to the man of whom I hired the carriage to fetch my visitor from the railway station on the day when she arrived. His order-book may help you to your date, even if this coachman who drove me proves to be of no use. These things I can do, and I will do, on conditions. I recite them. First condition. Madame Fosco and I leave this house when and how we please, without interference of any kind on your part. Second condition. You wait here in company with me to see my agent, who is coming at seven o'clock in the morning, to regulate my affairs. You give my agent a written order to the man who has got your sealed letter to resign his possession of it. You wait here till my agent places that letter unopened in my hands, and you then allow me one clear half-hour to leave the house, after which you resume your own freedom of action to go where you please. Third condition. You give me the satisfaction of a gentleman for your intrusion into my private affairs, and for the language you have allowed yourself to use to me at this conference, the time and place abroad to be fixed in a letter from my hand when I am safe on the continent, and that letter to contain a strip of paper measuring accurately the length of my sword. Those are my terms. Inform me if you accept them, yes or no. The extraordinary mixture of prompt decision, far-sighted cunning, and mountebank bravado in this speech staggered me for a moment, and only for a moment. The one question to consider was 
whether I was justified or not in possessing myself of the means of establishing Laura's identity at the cost of allowing the scoundrel who had robbed her of it to escape with impunity. I knew that the motive of securing the just recognition of my wife in the birthplace from which she had been driven out as an impostor, and of publicly erasing the lie that still profaned her mother's tombstone, was far purer in its freedom from all taint of evil passion than the vindictive motive which had mingled itself with my purpose from the first. And yet I cannot honestly say that my own moral convictions were strong enough to decide the struggle in me by themselves. They were helped by my remembrance of Sir Percival's death. How awfully in that last moment had the working of the retribution there been snatched from my feeble hands! What right had I to decide, in my poor mortal ignorance of the future, that this man too must escape with impunity because he escaped me? I thought of these things, perhaps with the superstition inherent in my nature, perhaps with a sense worthier of me than superstition. It was hard, when I had fastened my hold on him at last, to loosen it again of my own accord, but I forced myself to make the sacrifice. In plainer words, I determined to be guided by the one higher motive of which I was certain, the motive of serving the cause of Laura and the cause of truth. I accept your conditions, I said, with one reservation on my part. What reservation may that be? he asked. It refers to the sealed letter, I answered. I require you to destroy it unopened in my presence as soon as it is placed in your hands. My object in making this stipulation was simply to prevent him from carrying away written evidence of the nature of my communication with Pesca. The fact of my communication he would necessarily discover when I gave the address to his agent in the morning, but he could make no use of it on his own unsupported testimony, even if he really ventured to try the experiment, which need excite in me the slightest apprehension on Pesca's account. I grant your reservation, he replied after considering the question gravely for a minute or two. It is not worth dispute. The letter shall be destroyed when it comes into my hands." He rose as he spoke from the chair in which he had been sitting opposite to me up to this time. With one effort he appeared to free his mind from the whole pressure on it of the interview between us thus far. "'Oof!' he cried, stretching his arms luxuriously. The skirmish was hot while it lasted. Take a seat, Mr. Hartwright. We meet as mortal enemies hereafter. Let us, like gallant gentlemen, exchange polite attentions in the meantime. Permit me to take the liberty of calling for my wife." He unlocked and opened the door. "'Eleanor!' he called out in his deep voice. The lady of viperish face came in. "'Madame Fosco, Mr. Hartwright,' said the Count, introducing us with easy dignity. "'My angel,' he went on, addressing his wife. Will your labours of packing allow you time to make me some nice strong coffee? I have writing business to transact with Mr. Hartwright, and I require the full possession of my intelligence to do justice to myself." Madame Fosco bowed her head twice, once sternly to me, once submissively to her husband, and glided out of the room. The Count walked to a writing-table near the window, opened his desk, and took from it several quires of paper and a bundle of quill pens. He scattered the pens about the table, so that they might lie ready in all directions to be taken up when he wanted, and then cut the paper into a heap of narrow slips, of the form used by professional writers for the press. "'I shall make this a remarkable document,' he said, looking at me over his shoulder. "'Habits of literary composition are perfectly familiar to me. One of the rarest of all the intellectual accomplishments that a man can possess is the grand faculty of arranging his ideas. Immense privilege! I possess it. Do you?" He marched backwards and forwards in the room, until the coffee appeared, humming to himself, and marking the places at which obstacles occurred in the arrangement of his ideas, by striking his forehead from time to time with the palm of his hand. The enormous audacity with which he seized on the situation in which I placed him, and made it the pedestal on which his vanity mounted for the one cherished purpose of self-display, mastered my astonishment by main force. 
sincerely as I loathed the man, the prodigious strength of his character, even in its most trivial aspects, impressed me in spite of myself. The coffee was brought in by Madame Fosco. He kissed her hand in grateful acknowledgment, and escorted her to the door, returned, poured out a cup of coffee for himself, and took it to the writing-table. "'May I offer you some coffee, Mr. Hartwright?' he said, before he sat down. I declined. "'What, you think I shall poison you?' he said gaily. "'The English intellect is sound as far as it goes,' he continued, seating himself at the table. "'But it has one grave defect. It is always cautious in the wrong place.' He dipped his pen in the ink, and placed the first slip of paper before him, with a thump of his hand on the desk, cleared his throat, and began. He wrote with great noise and rapidity, in so large and bold a hand, and with such wide spaces between the lines, that he reached the bottom of the slip in not more than two minutes, certainly, from the time when he started at the top. Each slip, as he finished it, was paged, and tossed over his shoulder, out of his way, onto the floor. With his first pen worn out, that went over his shoulder too, and he pounced on a second from the supplies scattered about the table. Slip after slip, by dozens, by fifties, by hundreds, flew over his shoulders on either side of him, till he had snowed himself up in paper all around his chair. Hour after hour passed, and there I sat watching. There he sat writing. He never stopped, except to sip his coffee, and when that was exhausted, to smack his forehead from time to time. One o'clock struck two, three, four, and still the slips flew about all around him. Still the untiring pen scraped its way ceaselessly from top to bottom of the page. Still the white chaos of paper rose higher and higher all around his chair. At four o'clock I heard a sudden splutter of the pen, indicative of the flourish with which he signed his name. Bravo! he cried, springing to his feet with the activity of a young man and looking me straight in the face with a smile of superb triumph. "'Done, Mr. Hartwright!' he announced, with a self-renovating thump of his fist on his broad breast. "'Done to my own profound satisfaction, to your profound astonishment, when you read what I have written. The subject is exhausted. The man, Fosco, is not. I proceed to the arrangement of my slips, to the revision of my slips, to the reading of my slips, addressed emphatically to your private ear. Four o'clock has just struck. Good. Arrangement, revision, reading from four to five. Short snooze of restoration for myself from five to six. Final preparations from six to seven. Affair of agent and sealed letter from seven to eight. At eight are route. Behold the programme. He sat down, cross-legged on the floor among his papers, strung them together with a bodkin and a piece of string revised them, wrote all the titles and honours by which he was personally distinguished at the head of the first page, and then read the manuscript to me with loud theatrical emphasis and profuse theatrical gesticulation. The reader will have an opportunity ere long of forming his own opinion of the document. It will be sufficient to mention here that it answered my purpose. He next wrote me the address of the person from whom he had hired the fly, and handed me Sir Percival's letter. It was dated from Hampshire on the 25th of July, and announced the journey of Lady Glyde to London on the 26th. Thus, on the very day, the 25th, when the doctor's certificate declared that she had died in St. John's Wood, she was alive, by Sir Percival's own showing, at Blackwater, and on the day after she was to take a journey. When the proof of that journey was obtained from the flyman, the evidence would be complete. At quarter past five said the Count, looking at his watch. Time for my restorative snooze. I personally resemble Napoleon the Great, as you may have remarked, Mr. Hartwright. I also resemble that immortal man in my power of commanding sleep at will. Excuse me one moment. I will summon Madame Fosco to keep you from feeling dull. Knowing as well as he did that he was summoning Madame Fosco to ensure my not leaving the house while he was asleep, I made no reply, and occupied myself in tying up the papers which he had placed in my possession. The lady came in, cool, pale, and venomous as ever. "'Amuse, Mr. Hartwright, my angel,' said the Count. He placed a chair for her, kissed her hand for the second time, withdrew to a sofa, and in three minutes was as peacefully and happily asleep as the most virtuous man in existence. Madame Fosco took a book from the table, sat down, 
and looked at me with the steady vindictive malice of a woman who never forgot and never forgave I have been listening to your conversation with my husband she said if I had been in his place I would have laid you dead on the hearthrug with those words she opened her book and never looked at me or spoke to me from that time till the time when her husband woke he opened his eyes and rose from the sofa accurately to an hour from the time when he had gone to sleep I feel infinitely refreshed he remarked Eleanor my good wife are you already upstairs that is well my little packing here can be completed in ten minutes my travelling dress assumed in ten minutes more what remains before the agent comes he looked about the room and noticed the cage with his little white mice in it ah he cried piteously a last laceration of my sympathy still remains my innocent pets my little cherished children what am i to do with them for the present we are settled nowhere for the present we travel incessantly the less baggage we carry the better for ourselves my cockatoo my canaries my little mice who will cherish them when their good papa is gone he walked about the room deep in thought he had not been at all troubled about writing his confession but he was visibly perplexed and distressed about the far more important question of the disposal of his pets after long consideration he suddenly sat down again at the writing table an idea he exclaimed i will offer my canaries and my cockatoo to this vast metropolis my agent shall present them in my name to the zoological gardens of london the document that describes them shall be drawn up on the spot he began to write repeating the words as they flowed from his pen number one cockatoo of transcendent plumage attraction of himself to all visitors of taste number two canaries of unrivalled vivacity and intelligence worthy of the garden of eden worthy also of the garden in regent's park homage to british zoology offered by fosco the pen spluttered again and the flourish was attached to his signature count you have not included the mice said madame fosco he left the table took her hand and placed it on his heart all human resolution eleanor he said solemnly has its limits my limits are inscribed on that document i cannot part with my white mice bear with me my angel and remove them to their travelling cage upstairs admirable tenderness said madame fosco admiring her husband with a last viperish look in my direction she took up the cage carefully and left the room the count looked at his watch in spite of his resolute assumption of composure he was getting anxious for the agent's arrival the candles had long since been extinguished and the sunlight of the new morning poured into the room it was not until five minutes past seven that the gate bell rang and the agent made his appearance he was a foreigner with a dark beard mr hartwright monsieur rubel said the count introducing us he took the agent a foreign spy in every line of his face if there ever was one yet into the corner of the room whispered some directions to him and then left us together monsieur rebel as soon as we were alone suggested with great politeness that i should favour him with his instructions i wrote two lines to pesca authorising him to deliver my sealed letter to the bearer directed the note and handed it to Monsieur Rubel. The agent waited with me until his employer returned, equipped in travelling costume. The Count examined the address of my letter before he dismissed the agent. I thought so, he said, turning on me with a dark look, and altering again his manner from that moment. He completed his packing, and then sat consulting a travelling map, making entries in his pocket-book, and looking every now and then impatiently at his watch not another word addressed to myself passed his lips the near approach of the hour for his departure and the proof he had seen of the communication established between pesca and myself had plainly recalled his whole attention to the measures that were necessary for securing his escape a little before eight o'clock monsieur rebel came back with my unopened letter in his hand the count looked carefully at the superscription and the seal lit a candle burnt the letter I perform my promise, he said, but this matter, Mr. Hartwright, shall not end here. The agent had kept at the door the cab in which he had returned, 
He and the maid-servant now busied themselves in removing the luggage. Madame Fosco came downstairs, thickly veiled, with the travelling cage of white mice in her hand. She neither spoke to me nor looked towards me. Her husband escorted her to the cab. "'Follow me as far as the passage,' he whispered in my ear. "'I may want to speak to you at the last moment.' I went out to the door, the agent standing below me in the front garden. The Count came back alone, drew me a few steps inside the passage. "'Remember the third condition,' he whispered. "'You shall hear from me, Mr. Hartwright. "'I may claim from you the satisfaction of a gentleman sooner than you think for.' He caught my hand before I was aware of him, and wrung it hard, then turned to the door, stopped, and came back to me again. "'One word more,' he said confidentially. "'When I last saw Miss Halcombe she looked thin and ill. I am anxious about that admirable woman. Take care of her, sir. With my hand on my heart I solemnly implore you. Take care of Miss Halcombe.' Those were the last words he said to me before he squeezed his huge body into the cab and drove off. The agent and I waited at the door for a few moments, looking after him. While we were standing together, a second cab appeared from a turning a little way down the road. It followed the direction previously taken by the Count's cab, and as it passed the house with the open garden gate, a person inside looked at us out of the window. The stranger at the opera again, the foreigner with the scar on his left cheek. "'You wait here with me, sir, for half an hour more,' said Monsieur Rebel. "'I do.' We returned to the sitting-room. I was in no humour to speak to the agent, or to allow him to speak to me. I took out the papers which the Count had placed in my hands, and read the terrible story of the conspiracy, told by the man who had planned and perpetrated it. End of Track 36